1926 Subpart B, General Interpretations. 1926.10, Scope of Subpart. 1926.10, A, this subpart contains the general rules of the Secretary of Labor interpreting and applying the construction safety and health provisions of Section 107 of the Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act, 83 Stat. 96. Section 107 requires as a condition of each contract which is entered into under legislation subject to Reorganization Plan No. 14 of 1950, 64 Stat. 1267, and which is for construction, alteration, and or repair, including painting and decorating, that no contractor or subcontractor contracting for any part of the contract work shall require any laborer or mechanic employed in the performance of the contract to work in surroundings or under working conditions which are unsanitary hazardous, or dangerous to his health or safety, as determined under construction safety and health standards promulgated by the Secretary by regulation. 1926.11 Coverage under Section 103 of the Act Distinguished 1926.11 A. Coverage under Section 103 it is important to note that the coverage of Section 107 differs from that for the overtime requirements of the Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act. The application of the overtime requirements is governed by Section 103, which subject to specific exemptions, includes 1926.11 A. 1. Federal contracts requiring or involving the employment of laborers or mechanics, thus including, but not limited to, contracts for construction, and, 2. Contracts assisted in whole or in part by federal loans, grants, or guarantees under any statute providing wage standards for such work. The statutes providing wage standards for such work include statutes for construction which require the payment of minimum wages in accordance with prevailing wage findings by the Secretary of Labor in accordance with the Davis-Bacon Act. A provision to Section 103 excludes from the overtime requirements work where the federal assistance is only in the form of a loan guarantee or insurance. 1926.11 b. Coverage under Section 107 To be covered by Section 107 of the Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act, a contract must be one which, 1. is entered into under a statute that is subject to reorganization plan No. 14 of 1950, 64 Stat. 1267, and, 2, is for construction, alteration, and or repair, including painting and decorating. 1926.12, Reorganization Plan No. 14 of 1950. 1926.12, A, General Provisions. Reorganization Plan No. 14 of 1950 relates to the prescribing by the Secretary of Labor of appropriate standards, regulations, and procedures with respect to the enforcement of labor standards under federal and federally assisted contracts which are subject to various statutes subject to the plan. The rules of the Secretary of Labor implementing the plan are published in Part 5 of this title. Briefly, the statutes subject to the plan include the Davis-Bacon Act including its extension to federal aid highway legislation subject to 23 U.S.C. 113, and other statutes subject to the plan by its original terms, statutes by which the plan is expressly applied, such as the Contract Work Hours Standards Act by virtue of Section 104 d. thereof. 1926.12 b. The Plan 1926.12 b. 1. The Statutes Subject to Reorganization Plan No. 14 of 1950 are cited and briefly described in the remaining paragraphs of this section. These descriptions are general in nature and not intended to convey the full scope of the work to be performed under each statute. The individual statutes should be resorted to for a more detailed scope of the work. Note, the remainder of the reorganization plan number 14 of 1950 can be found on the following link. 1926.13 Interpretation of Statutory Terms 1926.13 A. The terms construction, alteration, and repair used in Section 107 of the Act are also used in Section 1 of the Davis-Bacon Act, 40 U.S.C. 276A, providing minimum wage protection on federal construction contracts, and Section 1 of the Miller Act, 40 U.S.C. 270A, providing performance and payment bond protection on federal construction contracts. 
Similarly, the terms contractor and subcontractor are used in those statutes, as well as in Copeland, Anti-Kickback, Act, 40 U.S.C. 276C, and the Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act itself, which apply concurrently with the Miller Act and the Davis-Bacon Act on federal construction contracts and also apply to most federally assisted construction contracts. The use of the same or identical terms in these statutes which apply concurrently with Section 107 of the Act have considerable precedential value in ascertaining the coverage of Section 107.1926.13 b. It should be noted that Section 1 of the Davis-Bacon Act limits minimum wage protection to laborers and mechanics employed directly upon the site of the work. There is no comparable limitation in Section 107 of the Act. Section 107 expressly requires as a self-executing condition of each covered contract that no contractor or subcontractor shall require any laborer or mechanic employed in the performance of the contract to work in surroundings or under working conditions which are unsanitary, hazardous, or dangerous to his health or safety as these health and safety standards are applied in the rules of the Secretary of Labor. 1926.13, see, the term subcontractor under Section 107 is considered to mean a person who agrees to perform any part of the labor or material requirements of a contract for construction, alteration or repair. C.F. McEvoy Company. V. United States, 322 U.S. 102, 108-9, 1944. A person who undertakes to perform a portion of a contract involving the furnishing of supplies or materials will be considered a subcontractor under this part in Section 107 if the work in question involves the performance of construction work and is to be performed. 1926.13 C1, directly on or near the construction site, or 1926.13 C2, by the employer for the specific project on a customized basis. Thus, a supplier of materials which will become an integral part of the construction is a subcontractor if the supplier fabricates or assembles the goods or materials in question specifically for the construction project and the work involved may be said to be construction activity. If the goods or materials in question are ordinarily sold to other customers from regular inventory, the supplier is not a subcontractor. Generally, the furnishing of pre-stressed concrete beams and pre-stressed structural steel would be considered manufacturing, therefore a supplier of such materials would not be considered a subcontractor. An example of material supplied for the specific project on a customized basis as that phrase is used in this section would be ventilating ducts, fabricated in a shop away from the construction job site and specifically cut for the project according to design specifications. On the other hand, if a contractor buys standard size nails from a foundry, the foundry would not be a covered subcontractor. Ordinarily, a contract for the supplying of construction equipment to a contractor would not, in and of itself, be considered a subcontractor for purposes of this part. 1926.14 Federal Contract for Mixed Types of Performance 1926.14 A. It is the intent of the Congress to provide safety and health protection of federal, federally financed, or federally assisted construction. C. For example, H. Report No. 91 to 241, 91st Kong, 1st Session, P. 1, 1969. Thus, it is clear that when a federal contract calls for mixed types of performance, such as both manufacturing and construction, Section 107 would apply to the construction. By its express terms, Section 107 applies to a contract which is for construction, alteration, and or repair. Such a contract is not required to be exclusively for such services. The application of the section is not limited to contracts which permit an overall characterization as construction contracts. The text of Section 107 is not so limited. 1926.14b, when the mixed types of performances include both construction and manufacturing, see also Section 1926.15b, concerning the relationship between the walsh Ely Public Contracts Act and Section 107. 1926.15 Relationship to the Service Contract Act, walsh Ely Public Contracts Act. 1926.15 A. A contract for construction is one for non-personal service. C. E.G. 41 CFR 1 to 1.208. Section 2 E. Of the Service Contract Act of 1965 requires as a condition of every federal contract 
and bid specification therefore, exceeding $2,500, the principal purpose of which is to furnish services to the United States through the use of the service employees, that certain safety and health standards be met. C-29 CFR Part 1925, which contains the department rules concerning these standards. Section 7 of the Service Contract Act provides that the Act shall not apply to any contract of the United States or District of Columbia for construction, alteration, and or repair, including painting and decorating of public buildings or public works. It is clear from the legislative history of Section 107 that no gaps in coverage between the two statutes are intended. 1926.15b, the Walsh-Healy Public Contracts Act requires that contracts entered into by any federal agency for the manufacture or furnishing of materials, supplies, articles, and equipment in any amount exceeding $10,000 must contain, among other provisions, a requirement that no part of such contract will be performed nor will any of the materials, supplies, articles, or equipment to be manufactured or furnished under said contract be manufactured or fabricated in any plants factories, buildings, or surroundings or under working conditions which are unsanitary or hazardous or dangerous to the health and safety of employees engaged in the performance of said contract. The rules of the Secretary concerning these standards are published in 41 CFR Part 50-204 and express the Secretary of Labor's interpretation and application of Section 1E of the walsh Healy Public Contracts Act to certain particular working conditions. None of the described working conditions are intended to deal with construction activities, although such activities may conceivably be a part of a contract which is subject to the walsh Healy Public Contracts Act. Nevertheless, such activities remain subject to the general statutory duty prescribed by Section 1E. Section 103B of the Contract Work Hours and Safety Standards Act provides, among other things, that the Act shall not apply to any work required to be done in accordance with the provisions of the walsh Healy Public Contracts Act. 1926.16 Rules of Construction 1926.16 A. The prime contractor and any subcontractors may make their own arrangements with respect to obligations which might be more appropriately treated on a job site basis rather than individually. Thus, for example, the prime contractor and his subcontractors may wish to make an express agreement that the prime contractor or one of the subcontractors will provide all required first aid or toilet facilities, thus relieving the subcontractors from the actual, but not any legal, responsibility, or, as the case may be, relieving the other subcontractors from this responsibility. In no case shall the prime contractor be relieved of overall responsibility for compliance with the requirements of this part for all work to be performed under the contract. 1926.16b, by contracting for full performance of a contract subject to Section 107 of the Act, the prime contractor assumes all obligations prescribed as employer obligations under the standards contained in this part, whether or not he subcontracts any part of the work. 1926.16c, to the extent that a subcontractor of any tier agrees to perform any part of the contract, he also assumes responsibility for complying with the standards in this part with respect to that part. Thus, the prime contractor assumes the entire responsibility under the contract and the subcontractor assumes responsibility with respect to his portion of the work. With respect to subcontracted work, the prime contractor and any subcontractor or subcontractors shall be deemed to have joint responsibility. 1926.16d, where joint responsibility exists, both the prime contractor and his subcontractor or subcontractors, regardless of tier, shall be considered subject to the enforcement provisions of the Act.